What if I told you that playing games online back in 1986 was way different than it is nowadays? You didn't need a fancy headset or a microphone. All you needed to do was talk to your TV and you'd hear your friend talking right back. It really is a great online service, but the weird thing is that it forces you to play in a padded room and they still haven't let me out yet. It's the late 80s, or early 90s if you're into that sort of thing, and you want to play a game with your friends. How do you do that? Hey, you seem like an interesting man. You're my friend now. Want to play Conflict for NES? Oh boy, do I ever! Alright, just so we're clear, you came here for Conflict, not Luxury, so you're gonna take the fucking Mad Cat's controller and you're gonna be a good friend! not even Mad Cats. It's official. What did I tell you about back talking? Literally nothing. Hell not until two seconds ago, bitch. Why oh, you fucking suck ass at this dude? <laughs> Fuck you! This is how people played video games together for a number of years, but as we all know, things change. Because move over, Player 2 port, you've just been replaced by a telephone line. 1985's Island of Kesmai was one of the first online multiplayer games that would help build the foundation of what would become the MMOs that we know today. Utilizing the CompuServe network, you could play D&D with a chat room or some shit for the low, low price of six dollars per hour. But what about consoles? What did they have to offer in terms of online connectivity? In 1988, Nintendo released the Famicom network system exclusively in Japan, and was one of the first dial-up modem peripherals for home gaming systems. It didn't play any games. Instead, you could trade stocks and bet on horse races. Because what Famicom owner in 1988 didn't love trading stocks and betting on horse races? It was a commercial failure and was discontinued in 1991. But even though Nintendo were scared shitless of making online multiplayer a feature in their modem, Sega decided to dive headfirst into this strange new world just like they do with everything they've ever done. Introducing MegaNet, Sega's online gaming service for the Mega Drive in Japan. It worked through the Mega Modem, a peripheral you would insert on the back of the system, along with all the other fun and interesting things you'd be able to attach to it later on. But the Mega Modem was no Famicom network system, that's for sure. This thing had a mic and speaker built in for in-game voice chat in 1990. It really was Sega's pathetic little Xbox Live. And with a compatible game and a big ass phone bill, you were playing games online. It didn't work very well though. People complained about lag, connection speeds, and the lack of compatible software. And because there was no dedicated servers hosting games or online matchmaking, you could really only use the Mega Modem if you knew other people that had a Mega Modem. The Mega Modem was discontinued around a year after its launch, but Sega would continue to release Wi-Fi enabled products going forward. You had the Sega Channel, a service which allowed you to download games to your Genesis for as long as the system was on. The Netlink Adapter, which allowed you to browse the internet on your Saturn as well as a, some online multiplayer. But Sega's final console, the Dreamcast, is probably the most significant as it's the very first home gaming console to include a dial-up modem built in. In addition to this, Sega created an online service called SegaNet in which they also used in a bid to increase Dreamcast sales by begging people to Holy shit, just take our system for free, we're bleeding money here! The Dreamcast also had a European-based online service known as Dream Arena. That's two different online services for two different regions. But who cares? The Dreamcast was a failure. Who the fuck even likes that thing? It's so like shit compared to- And then, a very rich white man wearing glasses took the stage and uttered the famous words. And then the original Xbox happened. The original Xbox was the start of something groundbreaking. Xbox Live. A subscription-based online gaming service launched in late 2002 that was more than just playing games online. With the inclusion of an internal hard drive in the system and the fact that it was a broadband-based service, 
you were able to have a unique gamer tag, install downloadable content, friends lists, and made voice chat a standard in online play. Sony and Nintendo would both release accessories that enabled networking on their systems, but neither would meet the industry impact or functionality of Xbox Live. This was huge, and it was only going to get bigger with the launch of Halo 2 in 2004. Don't mind the box, uh, going on, it's, it's, a. Uh... It's seen some shit. The first Halo revolutionized the first person shooter genre on console since its initial release in 2001, and allowed you to play multiplayer via local area network, or LAN. But Halo 2 took it one step further by implementing online matchmaking, which ended up becoming a huge cultural phenomenon. Alongside games such as Counter-Strike and Mech Assault, slowly but surely, a community was starting to develop surrounding online gaming. And let's not forget about online PC gaming during this time. The early 2000s was a period of exponential growth for massively multiplayer online games or MMOs. All thanks to broadband internet becoming more accessible and replacing dial-up. Take that, Dreamcast. But going back to the subject of consoles... They're mutating. Xbox 360, released in November of 2005, is the sequel to the New York Times bestseller, Xbox. And, uh, it was a little weird. The 360 initially launched with no built-in Wi-Fi. You had to go out and buy a wireless networking adapter to, if you wanted to connect wirelessly, but you could still use Ethernet if you wanted to. There was also no built-in storage. But you know what? It's all okay, because you know what is built-in? Xbox Live. So an interesting thing about Xbox Live on the OG Xbox is that you would have to go out and buy an Xbox Live starter kit. It was basically a box with all the shit you needed for Xbox Live, specifically a subscription code to which you would put into your Xbox and then your credit card information, and then boom, teabagging. But with the Xbox 360, Live was an integral part of the system's interface. You could sign up and get into the game just like that. And with tournaments, gamer zones, reputation, and an achievement system? Microsoft, you know I bought the system for teabagging, right? And Microsoft would just keep adding on to their online services this generation, especially with their new Xbox Experience update released in November of 2008. Featuring a major graphical overhaul of the 360's interface, as well as a new edition called Party Chat. Pretty much all of the online features provided on the 360 were fairly quick and easy to use too. The interface wasn't perfect, it's changed multiple times, but it's always been pretty intuitive and easy to grasp and learn. But let's not forget about the games you could play online on 360. The biggest one I'd say would have to be Halo 3, with its launch in 2007 probably being one of the biggest in gaming history. Like Master Chief comes to visit Times Square, starts handing out copies of Halo 3 to people left and right, and starts screaming at the top of his lungs, BELIEVE! 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 You, sir, right there, I will write down your gamer tag and friend you on Xbox Live, and when I do, we will play some slay or capture the flag, or oddball, or maybe even scuds. But what if you were one of those people who didn't want to go to Times Square and get a copy of Halo 3 from Master Chief and you just wanted Halo 3? Well, you're in luck, because the Xbox 360 alongside other 7th generation consoles included the digital storefront which allowed you to download games directly to your system. And alongside AAA titles, indie games were downloadable under the moniker of Xbox Live Arcade. And some of these indie titles also included online functionality. You know, like Castle Crashers, Battle Block Theater, Super Meat Boy had online leaderboards. It was amazing. All in all, the Xbox 360 took what the original Xbox did with online gaming and multiplied it by the total number of Xbox 360s that got red ringed. But what about the competition? PlayStation 3 launched in November of 2006 with a high price and no games. But it was the introduction of Sony's new online service, PlayStation Network, or PSN for short. From my own personal experience, uh, PS3's online wasn't bad. I mean, a lot of the features seen in Xbox Live are here, like friends, messaging, downloadable content, and achievements going under the name trophies. I just find that the interface wasn't as intuitive as Xbox Live on the 360 was. And a lot of things are just more difficult and time consuming, like downloads. Those took fucking forever on PS3. But on a positive note, the PS3 didn't charge you to play online like Xbox Live did and still does. Let me introduce you to PlayStation Plus. 
a premium online service that grants you access to exclusive content, a selection of free games to download every month, and later on, access to online multiplayer. Great. But what about Nintendo's online offerings throughout the 7th generation? The Nintendo DS and Wii both had online play through the Nintendo Wi-Fi connection service. But that's all this service really did though, it just had online play. But the Wii did have Wii Connect 24. It was more of a feature than a standalone online service that allowed a Wii system to remain connected to the internet while in sleep mode. It also handled the sending and receiving of messages through the Wii message board, as well as the operation of applications that required it. And there's also a friends list on the Wii. With friend codes! Thanks, Reggie! My body is ready! To put it simply, the seventh generation was a very important time in gaming history when console manufacturers were starting to embrace online connectivity in their systems. Some more than others. But then we have the eighth generation, where some manufacturers would improve aspects of their online services while one would piss everyone off. May 21st, 2013. Microsoft announces the price is right, alongside a really cool box you could watch it on. The Xbox One reveal was a disaster, but not just because Microsoft showed a TV guide as the next big leap for gaming, but also because that this new system would be always online. And when I say always online, I mean you had to have a persistent internet connection if you wanted the system to function correctly. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. Connect was required and you couldn't play used games. This just goes to show that although online connectivity is a very important facet of gaming today, no console should rely on it simply because not everyone can have these persistent internet connections. And to be fair, Microsoft did realize what they were doing and removed the always online component before launch, but that didn't change the initial price point of $4.99, an infinitely less intuitive user interface, and the fact that Sony was stabbing them repeatedly with this very kitchen knife. I got it from my uncle who works at Nintendo, I mean Sony. While the people at Sony were getting off on swapping PS4 discs with each other because, you know, you couldn't do that on the stupid fucking Xbox One, they were hard at work on perfecting the online functionality of the PS4. And I'd say it was definitely an improvement over the PS3. For instance, there's party chat, better messaging, uh, downloading takes three years instead of five. It was fucking revolutionary. But again, what about Nintendo? The Wii U launched in November 2012 with Nintendo Network. And I'd say it's an online service that's definitely a step up from the Wii. I mean, for one, you could add friends without friend codes. To which Nintendo brought them back for the Switch. Thanks, Reggie. My bot but Nintendo likes to do this really scary thing in which they'll introduce a new online service for every one of their new systems. Like the DS and Wii had Nintendo Wi-Fi connection, uh, the Wii U and 3DS had Nintendo Network, and now we have Nintendo Switch Online, and boy do I have quite a bit to say about that last one. Nintendo Switch Online is a bitch. First of all, you have to pay for it, which you didn't have to do on any other Nintendo system. And not only that, it's spotty as hell. Like every single time I played Switch Sports, like there's always at least one match so they get booted off because of connectivity issues. Like, what the fuck, Nintendo? But you know what? No online gaming service is perfect. All of them have their quirks and annoyances, and that's honestly to be expected with this medium. But it's really cool to see online play go from being these weird little experiments from the late 80s and early 90s to a staple of modern gaming culture. And that kind of makes me appreciate it a whole lot more, as well as just playing with other people. Hey, uh, remember me? Oh yeah, you're that guy who insulted me and ruined my love for conflict! Yeah, about that, I'm, I'm really sorry about the things I said and you know, I was hoping we could start over. So uh, here's my gamer tag. Wanna play Halo 3? Uh, I have a PlayStation 3. Give it to me. Give it to me! Fucking PlayStation dick rider. Put the knife down. Put the knife down.